when the world lost a legendary voice actor, Mako, um, nobody had the most unenviable task of filling in his shoes than Greg Baldwin. And he did, like, I think more than an admirable job filling in for our favorite uncle, Uncle Iroh, Aku, and Master Splinter Ninja Turtles. <laughs> At MomoCon this year, I had an opportunity to sit down with Greg in the press conference interview, and it was, honest to God, one of my favorite experiences of the entire weekend. Anytime he shows up to a convention or something, like I always make sure to stop in and hear him talk because he's always dropping gems. If you don't follow him on Twitter, like I'm going to put his Twitter down in the thing down below. Um, he is an excellent follow on Twitter as well, and he is just like overall just a cool guy. <laughs> Once again, thank you to Greg for your time. Thank you to MomoCon for allowing me the opportunity to have that speak, the time to speak to him. And without further ado, my press conference interview with Greg Baldwin after the intro. social media was not so pervasive and toxic as it is today. I think if, the, if social media was like it is today then, that maybe that people wouldn't have been so, so kind to me. But I, I realized from the moment I got the part that people are going to say, hey, you're no Mako. And I figured out the best way to counter that is to say, absolutely, I'm not Mako. Mako was nominated for the Academy Award and a Tony Award. Mako's resume spans three decades of good, solid work. I don't, I, I could never be Mako if I tried. You know, I'm not going to be nominated for an Oscar. So once we meet on that, I level the playing field that everybody say, you're right, I agree with you, I'm no Mako. I think everybody was a lot more, you know, cool with me voicing the part, you know. And I, I truly do, you know, I, I have been a fan of his since 1977, when I first heard his voice in a Sondheim musical called Pacific Overtures. And, you know, it, it's not an act, I truly do admire this man's work very, very much. And after all that he has given me in my life, it makes me, you know, I, 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 it makes me happy that I can give a little bit back to him by continuing to honor all he did when he was here. And I hope to meet him someday. Just not today. <laughs> you did an amazing job. Though. You're Thank you. Hello, I'm Polaris. I'm also with JB vs. the World. How you doing? Hello, my friend. Uh, you had mentioned in a panel I was there earlier today that you one of the uh, things you would like to see if they were to expand the Avatar universe as a prequel uh, of sorts about um, Iroh. And I was just wondering, I know you didn't create the character, but I was wondering what your take on that character would be if he was younger and we got to see the general that he was before we got to see the benevolent being that he is. I think, I think that would be interesting, you know, because I think Iroh was not always the kind, loving, you know, wise uncle that we know. He was basically a war criminal, you know? He was not a nice guy. And I think it might be jarring for people to see that side of him, but I think it actually might, you know, would appreciate the softer side of him even more. And, and it's literally, it's like that fan said to me, and we talked about Iroh's uh, redemption arc. And I, I do believe that the more I think about it, Zuko is Iroh's redemption arc. His redemption arc begins with the death of his son, and it ends when he has molded the new Fire Lord into a good and kind and a benevolent Fire Lord, you know? So yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think that, is, that is something I definitely would like to see. But I think it would, I think it would be jarring to people, you know? But I think they'd probably get used to it because everybody knows what his past is. So I think people would still be interested in seeing it and not just too taken aback by it. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Fantastic. My name is Glenn Long, Bingham Authority. So out of all the projects you've done, right, um, because you know so much and I appreciate it, 
I even looked at you, the TMNT, right? Which is actually really cool. Uh, what has been your uh, best experience? Can you tell me what project was your best experience, right? For you, being out of you know, everything from in cast to actually doing it, meeting the cast, stuff like that. What's been the best project for you? I, I would have to say, and I, I would absolutely say that Iro has been my favorite part. And uh, being part of the Avatar universe has been my absolute. I never expected anything like this. The cast never expected anything like this. When we did the show, we knew it was a good show and it was well written, but if you had told us, oh, 15 years from now, they're gonna be lining up to meet all of you, we would have said, well, first of all, that sounds fantastic. And then we would have said, well, you're crazy. To be a part, and it's happened to me literally three times within the last two hours, people will come up and they will cry and tell me these stories. And a couple of times it, it almost got me crying as well. And it means that as, as an actor or as a storyteller, it means that we've done our job. You know, we've made, we've changed people's lives. We have made them laugh or cry, but mostly we've made them think. And we touched them. And, and to be part of something that has genuinely moved people the way Avatar has, and specifically the way Uncle Iroh's wisdom has. Because I hear again and again, you know, I didn't get along with my father. Iroh was my father figure. That's, that, that's some, some heavy shoes to step into, but you know what? In, in this world, in this, in this dark world in which we live, any ray of light that we can find is a good ray of light. And if I can, can sort of represent that in the actual world, that is, that's the greatest job in the world, and I'm blessed and lucky to have it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Corbin Shanklin with the Illuminati. Hello, my friend. So first, I just wanted to say, uh, when I was a kid, I absolutely adored the, the animated TMNT movie. I still do today, so oh, like, it, is, it is incredibly like a dream come true to talk to you. So talking about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, um, what, what are your favorite parts about that world and about Master Splinter? Well, I, I would have to say that, that he was voiced by Mako. And I've sort of grown up with the Turtles. I remember I was a little old when they came out. I was probably in my... Was it the 70s or the 80s when they came out? I think it might have been the 80s, so I remember watching it. It's been interesting to me watching the various alliterations of it, you know, iterations. I think that's the word, not alliteration. That's yeah. something altogether different. Yeah, you said it right. You said it right. You said it right. <laughs> so it's been interesting watching it. And I do agree, of all of all the teenage music, I, I liked that particular, the CGI was perfect. And, you know, I... I I felt a little bit bad at the time because I, they called me up and it's like, well, I'm kind of, Iro had just happened and I guess they knew about this and they had found a voice actor. And I, I, at the time I felt, for that matter, I still feel a little bit, of, I guess you could almost call it stolen valor, you know, because I'm not Mako, but I have been really had a wonderful life and it benefited mightily because of Mako. So at that time especially when i wasn't I, I had barely started voicing iro it felt weird to be going in and doing all this dialogue for splitter yeah. knowing that the man himself was no longer able to do it you know and then it all and it also felt weird because he that was his last credited role and it's like you know i i don't want to really be it, it felt a little weird I'm, I'm glad that i had the opportunity but that especially felt a little weird to me at the time because he was credited as, as, as you know Splitter, and I was credited as additional voices, and so it just it's felt as people say, oh, you were Master Splitter, and I was like, I was, uh, I didn't actually voice Splitter because I'm not credited as Splitter, and I don't want to step on Mako's credits, so it's like I'm eh, sort of Splitter. I'm Splitterish, Splitterish, I would say. If I sign anything, I will sign it. Greg Baldwin's Splitterish, Splitterish. Thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. Robert from Thorography. Hello, so, my friend. So I caught a little bit of your um, uh, your panel earlier. I had to run around, um, and you mentioned like you're the only um, cast member of Avatar with a tattoo. That is correct. So you're a diehard geek. I am. I I got this. I never thought of myself as a tattoo person, you know, because I hate needles. So it's like I don't think I don't think that's going to be a good fit for me. But I had this idea that I would put the lotus tile, and I got just a temporary tattoo, and I would wear it at cons, just as sort of an Easter egg for fans who notice it and go, "Oh wow," you know. And then the funny thing was that the longer I would wear it at cons, I would suddenly not take it off. And the next thing you know, I'm going through five, six tattoos a month. I think it's costing me fifty, sixty dollars a month. My wife says, "Hey." Dude, man up, go down to the tattoo parlor and have it done. And the, they say that once you get one, you want more. 
from almost the minute that this had healed over, they took the stuff off of it. It's like, oh, what if I put a, a Fire Nation emblem around the White Lotus tile? And what if I somehow worked Aku from Samurai Jack in? I put, you know, you know, the Jedi insignia. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, time was, I said, does anybody really want to see a 62-year-old man with a sleeve? Yeah, maybe not, but you know, the beauty of being 62 is I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. So I, I said it to the family, but it's true. You know, they said that you really want something that permanent on your body. I'm 62. It's not going to be that permanent. <laughs> you know, just literally. I give it 20 years tops, you know, and it, it'll be gone. Not to bring everybody down, you know. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark from Blurred Photography. However, I am asking a question on behalf of our junior associate person. Uh, track uh, could not be here at this moment, but she has a two part question to ask you. All righty. All right, the first question is um, hold on one second. If, did you want to play a more villainous role in Avatar? And the second part of that qu uh, of her question is Do you have a nephew that you give great advice to? I do, ha I do have one nephew. I have, oh, and I actually mentioned to my wife, I, I thought, Listen, it ironic. The uncle Iroh is his famous you know, uncle, and I literally have only one nephew in all the world. And the nicest thing, it was the nicest thing my wife ever said to me. She said, Greg, you have millions of nieces and nephews. And, and it sounds a little weird, but I actually, the more and the longer I live in sort of this Iroh adjacent world, I do start to think of everybody as nieces and nephews. And so it's kind of, honestly, being, being almost universally beloved is fantastic. I just want to say that. No one has ever come up to me and go, oh, I hated your character on, you know, on Avatar. And as far as playing a more villainous role in, in Avatar, fortunately, again, thanks to Mako, I was able to play a more villainous version of Iroh, but it was simply named Aku and Samurai Jack. So as I always say, we all aspire to be Uncle Iroh, but every now and then you just have to have an Aku day. <laughs> and indeed, if you follow my Twitter, you'll see what I mean. Sometimes I have Aku days. <laughs> <laughs> I follow you on Twitter, and you are a fantastic follow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, who, you said you're a long-time fan of Game of mm -hmm. Who is your favorite turtle, and why is it Leonardo? <laughs> it's Leonardo, because, you know, he's named after Leonardo. Da Vinci is Leonardo. That's why Leonardo. Although I kind of like Michelangelo, too, to be honest with you, you know? Yeah. What's the reason why? Why is he the name? Uh, mainly, I just kind of like the name. <laughs> to be honest with you, I think it's kind of a cool name, you know. Thank you. Um, and can you tell us, um, like, when did you start getting into geeky and nerdy things, or what that landscape was like that for you growing up? From the moment I, from the moment I was ten years old, and you know, I, I remember it very, very distinctly. My parents had taken my little brother and I, dropped us off at the movie theater to see a film called Scrooge. It was a musical with Albert Finney, and I don't, I don't think I'd ever seen a musical before. And we got there early, just as the film was ending, and the, it ends with this giant production number, which is just joy heaped on top of joy heaped on top of joy. Everyone's singing and dancing, and I swear, it was all, I was only 10 years old, but it was like a religious experience for me. I, I literally started crying, and I didn't know why. And later, I know that I realized I wanted to make everybody else as happy as that movie was making. And so that's sort of when I discovered musicals. And once I discovered musicals, baby, that was my geeky culture for the longest time. Uh, and even today, I, in the name of, think of musical, I can probably sing a whole song from it. I love musicals since I was 10 years old. Uh, and indeed, because it was because of a musical that ultimately I was cast as Uncle Iroh. Because I loved the musical that he was in called Pacific Overtures by Sondheim. And I loved it, and I would sing along with the record over and over and over again, like you do. And I had no idea at the time that I was actually working on a Mako impression. So, you know, musicals, yeah, I, I am a musical nerd, and musicals have changed my life in very, very good ways. Thank you. Two follow that up. What's your favorite musical or play and single episode of a TV show that has a episode? Now, my favorite, my favorite episode of Avatar is Tales from Ba Sing Se, without a doubt, you know. <laughs> uh, because I like, I, everybody, it's that seminal moment when he's singing, it's so sad, I like to cry, you know. Now, my favorite musical, that's a, li that's a little trickier because there's musicals from different eras. 
If, you got, if you're talking golden era, I probably would have to say it would be My Fair Lady. If you're talking about the more the 60s and 70s when Sondheim came onto the scene, it would have to be Pacific Overtures. And then moving forward into the 90s and the, and the big giant musicals, I have to admit I am a fan of Wicked and I'm a, I am a big fan of Hamilton too, you know. Lin-Manuel, Sondheim is gone, but thank God we have Lin-Manuel, you know. Thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, just follow up on his question. Uh, since you love musicals, do you love or hate when bands ask you to sing the song? The song? Yes. It, it surprises me because I've been so vocal about, you know, not singing, and it surprises me when people still ask. And no, actually, it makes, I'm, I'm happy to tell them it's like I will, I will not sing the song. Uh, and, and it really is because I, I, I feel like it's not my song. That episode was dedicated to Mako, and that, probably for a lot of people who watch Avatar, that is one of the moments that really is stuck in their memory. And I don't, I don't want to mess with that memory in any way. So not only do I want to thank Mako and respect him and say thank you for your life and I honor your legacy, I also can't sing it as well. And I don't want people to, you know, think, I, I don't want to sully anybody's memory. And it, and it does make me think, because I'm lucky, I can say I don't want to sing it. But Paul Sun Hyung Lee, who's going to be playing Iroh, live action Iroh, the Netflix adaptation, is not going to have that option. And I don't see any way, the, there's only way, one way I think they could do it and none of the fans are going to be bothered by it. Have Mako's actual rendition of the song playing softly in the background. And that way, nobody's going to be upset. Because if he sings it, there are going to be fans that don't like it. If he doesn't sing it, there's going to be a lot of fans that don't like it. So it's kind of a no-win situation. So just let Marco sing his song. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Greg. I, I just want to say one thing. You were the very first uh, guest I moderated for last year. And now you are the last one I get to moderate for. Oh! So I appreciate that, sir. Um, you have some time to do a few pictures. Absolutely, I do. Yeah. Do my my flight doesn't lead to late twenty. I'm good.